Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 691. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's October 12th, 2021. All right, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted, where you sit down and watch two guys try and hash out all the news that's Anglican, a lot of the news that's Christian, and some of the news that's just secular, cultural, disgusting. We have to do this, because you need to be an informed audience, and we appreciate that you sit down and, and watch us and listen to us, and we appreciate most of all that you click the like button. I, you knew I was going to work that in, didn't you? Yeah. You got to do go to YouTube and Facebook, you click that like button, uh, you got to share the program with your friends, family, and foe. Please go to the comment sections, we read all the comments. You The comment section serves many purposes. First. You help us with our pronunciation of foreign uh, uh, places, so we appreciate that. Uh, Russian mafia names, that helps a lot. Uh, also, correct us when we're wrong and encourage us when we're right. And give us your opinion on what we talk about. We really appreciate that. We do have a podcast. If you don't want to watch us in video format, you go and click on the podcast link in the show notes on YouTube. So, did I cover everything? Yeah, I think I got it all. George, how you been doing this week? Busy, busy. I just got back from Naples, Florida. Uh, my wife and I attended the second part of our Catechesis of Good Shepherd training program. Mm -hmm. And so I'm all uh, chock full of uh, great ideas for children's education and and whatnot. Sure. That's uh, a lot of fun. Well, it'll be a great spark as you guys come out of COVID. Uh, we're now into October. Yeah, fall is certainly set up here in Kentucky where I'm located and uh, we're heading south and getting more and more uh, updates from my neighbors who have finally uh, the snowbirds moved back to Webster in, in the area they're parking the RVs in the RV park and sending pictures of the beautiful sunset you're having down there so uh, it seems Florida has returned to a normal climate finally well it'll hit its peak uh, in uh, the next week or so uh, when the last of the uh, humid weather passes and we just start the season too all right so let's discuss the difficulty we had in our pre-show and normally we get together george and i we both have a good news story that we want to to hash out okay let's talk about this good news story oh, i got a good news story let's talk about this good news story this week we sat and we looked through everywhere i went to a, a website called goodnewsstories.com and they didn't even have good news stories it was a really rough week to find a good news story especially in the christian world uh, if you look around the world, there's a lot of persecution going on. Uh, famine is about to start retaking places because of hyperinflation. Um, it, it's a mess right now. The good news is the gospel. The good news is in Christ, certainly. But George, at the last minute, you said you found one. <laughs> Tell me it's a real good news story. Well, Kevin, remember we started off by saying our personal lives are just great. It's sure. wonderful when everything is working out mm -hmm. and our churches are coming back and the Lord gospel is being preached and lives are being changed. But as we look through the news, we let's just the non-Christian world, the economy, inflation, stagflation, gas prices, food prices, um, political uncertainty. And then we move into the church and the same sort of spirit of chaos is inflicting is infecting the institutional church and so finally the good news we found that the uh, james bond movie came out premiered this week so that's the only good news that i can find i didn't know that was going to be the good news oh and actually i went to see the bond movie it's, it's an okay flick you know it's not the best i think skyfall is the the best uh bond movie of the last 20 years but uh I, i'm sorry <laughs> kevin nothing will top goldfinger oh um, george what about moonraker Moonraker was just the the sci-fi fantasy film of the uh, the eighties. So <laughs> just just so many to choose from. So yeah, this ends the franchise with Daniel Craig, and it, it's so sad that that was our good news story. But uh, the good news is certainly the gospel. Uh, George and I are you know clearly search the news all the time. We do look for the good news stories, and this is where we're going to ask our audience. Listen, sometimes if you could pop us 
through the email anglican tv at gmail.com a good news story so we could have a good fresh one every week this is the first falter we've had in like three months you know um so yay bond all right we got lots of other stories here that we get to talk about this week on anglican unscripted uh archbishop george carey was addressing the bell society and said we need to outsource our investigations now this is a big story because my leading link sent to me by one of our viewers this morning uh linked to a web story oh i gotta find it here real quick from the daily mail from the daily mail uh, uh where archbishop justin Welby uh is reported to need to face disciplinary action over this sexual abuse case scandal says the lawyer of the victim and i said how do we get this all packaged together in one story just have the english story after the good news story we didn't really have a good news story but we got a big story here it should be outsourced because just watching the bungling that justin welby did with uh the investigations he's been a part of clearly the church of england does not know how to investigate itself George Carey says it's time to outsource it. You and I both agree. George Carey gave a very thoughtful speech, the George Bell Society, uh, that's published on their website and on Anglican Inc. Mm -hmm. And well, the, uh, Carey talked about his failings with the Peter Ball. Bishop Peter Ball was the pedophile bishop, pervert bishop, who basically flew under everyone's radar Everybody thought he was just wonderful, but he was doing horrific things to young men. And George Carey was snookered, and Prince Charles, and judges, and everybody. Well, so Carey talks about his failings in the George Bell, in the uh, Peter Ball saga. Then he moved into discussion of George, the George Bell affair, where Bell was probably one of the most significant Anglican bishops of the 20th century, and yet his reputation was trashed uh, unfairly, and the trashing was done by the Church of England itself. And then he spoke about his own difficulties of being accused of uh, essentially being indifferent or covering up abuse, and his own recent suspension for in the Jonathan uh, John Smythe affair, where Smythe was a uh, part-time student at the theological college in the 80s that he was the principal of. And that was enough for him to be suspended by uh, Justin Welby. Now this comes just as two, two law firms in England are making a stink and using the Daily Mail to make the stink for them uh, in lawsuits against the Church of England. None of the facts are new in this case. The facts are there was a uh, priest, Canon John Roberts, I believe his name was. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, friends. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Who was at Liverpool Cathedral, where Welby was dean. And this fellow molested young men. And some of the victims came forward, and one of them talked to Welby himself. Welby essentially threw him out of his office, said, don't bother me. And he threw him out of the office because the fellow was rude to the receptionist. And Welby just said it was a he said, she said case, and I've known this priest, and he, how could he possibly do anything wrong? It's exactly what the Peter Ball scenario. Uh, if I know this man, he's wonderful. The person saying bad things, therefore, must be just out for something. Well, it turned out later that this man was arrested by the police and he's now serving an eight-year jail term for sexual abuse. Well, they didn't pass this on uh, to the police because the victim didn't want to uh, have the police involved. Well, he basically sat on his hands and allowed an abuser to remain in his job, somebody who in his history already had a conviction for abuse. This is when Welby was dean of Liverpool. And these two law firms are basically going to the Daily Mail with their briefs pre-written, painting Justin Welby in the most awful of terms. Now, Kevin Yoon and I and followers of this show have heard these stories before, but it's being repackaged for the press 
sure uh in the in, and so there's not so much anything new except it's now reached the point of the tipping point where Welby's no longer given the benefit of the doubt by uh, the British press. And these law firms feel that they are strong enough to basically do a head-on attack against Justin Welby. Now, George Carey's speech came before Welby's outing uh, yes, this morning in today's Daily Mail. But what George Carey was saying is what history has taught us with the Peter Ball affair, with the George Bell affair, is that bishops are too close to the situation. Their natural inclination is to protect the institution, to take on trust what their clergy tell them. And they don't do this out of malice. They just, it's just human nature to believe people like you, other clergy, and disbelieve people from the outside group. So the church really to be an effective deterrent to abuse needs to outsource it to people who have an independent point of view. And this is very significant because this uh, is the best way forward. And, ha and George Carey has nothing to lose for speaking the truth at this stage of his career. And I salute him. He's admitted his mistakes in the uh, Peter Ball affair. And he's actually learned from them. And one of the things we keep hearing, lessons will be learned. Well, they'd never learn anything from these things. No, the, George the, Carey the, is actually taking it to heart and saying, we really need to do this. We can't yeah. put it off any longer. Yeah, I mean, it may be too late, but let's let's try now. We, we see organizations like the ACNA always outsources uh, their important investigations. And uh, I think the Episcopal Church did a couple where they outsourced it. So, you know, outsourcing is your best choice in this type of situation because i've seen this before where the church kind of even at the clergy and bishop level want to gaslight the accuser you know mm -hmm. yeah this happened but are you sure you're just not thinking it happened and it didn't really happen or you know you know and so they want to instantly blame the accuser in order to protect the uh, the accused and um, it, it creates more victims, um, and it, it, it solidifies that this is going to be where the church is going to further harm this person and not be the helper. We, we saw a, a, a good way of handling this in uh, the Diocese of Atlantic's uh, handling of the Truro affair, mm -hmm. where the acting rector was accused by uh, some women of inappropriate behavior in the past. And this, the, the acting rector was well loved uh, by uh, people in the congregation. He had his fans, and people just would not believe this. Now he had his detractors, mind you. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that he was he wasn't per I'm not saying he was perfect. But if the old system of a he said she said, and you measure this man's reputation of being excellent above reproach against these unknown women. It was easy to just dismiss them as being sort of hysterical. But an independent investigation by trained people were able to suss out that, you know, the probability is it is more likely than not that the women are telling the truth. Hmm. And when you have somebody who is independent who can make these judgments, they can be presented without a sphere of bias of, uh, oh, well, we're out, they're out to get him or they're out to get the women um, it really works better this way. Yeah. And well, I, then, I salute those churches that are strong enough to have adopted it. A third party is not out there to protect anybody. They're not and there to protect is, the institution. They're not there to protect uh, the accusers. And this is the, at heart, the base accusation against the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. They had that uh, lay minister who was accused of all these uh, criminal sexual misconduct and the accusation is is that they basically wouldn't believe the uh, victims they believe the accuser and they basically sought to protect the institution that's the charge against the diocesan officials um the individual is uh, they, they they protected the accused not the accuser i'm sorry you're right that's they right. protected the <laughs> we got to be so right on these <laughs> <laughs> you, with, with, they protected the accused. Yes. And because they were too close to the situation, mm -hmm. these were personal friends that they knew that 
this was you know a church plant and they had put a lot of time and effort and they wanted it to succeed and this is the sort of thing that would kill a church plant hmm. so even without the unconscious bias i don't like using those terms because they've been overused but the predilection is not to believe the accuser but to defend the accused and when you do outsource it from the beginning i think you have a better outcome the truth can prevail yeah and it's nice that the ACNA has a process. We hope that uh, the Church of England uh, can certainly change their process and allow for this new procedure uh, to help in a situation that is clearly well documented within uh, the Church of England. We heard about the Roman Catholic Church of uh, France uh, last week that uh, they had some problems that they're just not addressing well. And we're just going to to be sure that the church isn't making things worse and we, we get here on a uh, a tuesday morning looking for good news and there it's really sad that there wasn't any george well there is good news in the sense that we have simultaneous to all this peter welby the, uh, peter selby the former bishop of worcester a, a leading liberal of the past generation one of mm -hmm. carrie's peers mm -hmm. had an opinion piece in the church times that said the church of england institutions are basically uh, failing of uh, failures of justice they're uh, not essentially he's saying the same things as George Carey is uh, that you know we need to have independence of the reviewers we need to have uh, truth being told we need not to respect power and authority but to put truth above all and you've got Selby and Carey who are sort of bookends theologically one is a liberals liberal Kinsari was a conservative and they're saying the same things after their careers in the church. And I think it's good that these men are not putting their efforts into protecting the institution, but in perfecting the institution, trying to find a way for it to truly be an institution that serves the needs of the people. So I think that is good news because too often the default position is to cover up and lie. Yeah, cover up and run. All right, that's the story. Two good news story and our Church of England story of the week. Let's move on and talk some uh, Gafka news. Uh, we have talked uh, recently about the consecration of another uh, woman bishop in Kenya, and that has kind of made the news. And we're getting more and more response out of uh, different places in the ACNA and kind of around the world as to what people really think about it. And in my term, in how I think about it, is Gafcon has just returned to square one. Yeah, they were having a great chess game. They're doing really good. They're, the pawns were all in the right places. They had the bishops lined up really well. The rook was just about to attack. And Kenya says, hey, listen, <laughs> we're going to do our things our way. And it really hurt Gafcon. And it hurt uh, certainly some dioceses within the ACNA who had put a lot of uh, faith and trust that uh, Gafcon was going to be different. Gafcon was going to be the way forward in how we address issues together in a conciliatory way. And yes, there's some tough issues out there, but we're going to do this together as brothers. And when Kenya dropped the ball on, on women bishops, um, we're starting to see more and more fallout. Uh, forward in faith, uh, North America put out a statement that basically highlights that, George. Forward in Faith released a statement uh, endorsed by uh, heavy hitters on the Anglo-Catholic wing of the uh, Anglican Church in North America. Uh, the head of Forward in Faith, Eric Meniz, Sam Joaquin, uh, Ray Sutton, uh, Keith Ackerman, Jack Eicher, Bill Wantland, Ryan Reed. Um, the, these are people of substance in the Anglo and the Anglo-Catholic wing. And they put out a very strongly worded statement, which we've published on Anglican Inc., uh, condemning the consecration of Rose Aquino as uh, Bishop of uh, Butare, Butare, Bishop well, of Western was, Kenya. Yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially saying, look, this is, uh, we, we appreciate that you seek fidelity to the gospel, and we know that you're not kooky on other issues, but you've really stepped over the line here um, because this is an innovation that is not consistent with the historic practices of the church the faith once received 
And so they lay out their opposition to what was done in very strong terms, no attempt to sort of soften the blow. And they don't make any threats. They don't say what they're going to do about it. But they're just making it quite clear that this was uh, a major uh, failing of the church as an institution in Kenya. So th this thing's not going away. No. Um, well, let's talk, you know, uh, let's back up. And this isn't a defense of Kenya. Okay, but I think the there's some Episcopal Church money that is having influence in some of these dioceses because now we see another Kenya diocese go rogue against their archbishop and say, listen, um, we don't care that you don't want politicians in our churches. This is an election time. We're going to bring them in. We're going to let them speak to their people. And now I have been to many consecrations in Africa, Uganda, Kenya, you, you just up and down the coast there in Tanzania. And when they get their people together, they're not just there for the, con the, the consecration. They're there to hear from the mayor. They're there to hear from any visiting politicians, from all the you know organizations of that city who want to welcome the visitors and stuff like that. So a consecration that happens in Africa is five or six hours long because you have to hear from all these people. This is the way that they know they have all the people in one little space, they get to talk to them. The same can happen in a church. A politician says, listen, I'm going to be in town on Sunday. Can I visit your congregation? And this bishop of this diocese in Kenya says, yes, even though his archbishop forbids it, George. October of last year, Kenya celebrated its 50th anniversary as a province, the uh, independent province. And in the uh, sermon, Jackson Olisapit, the archbishop, the primate of Kenya, uh, delivered in Mombasa, said that we will we are forbidding politicking from the pulpit we will no longer permit politicians to speak to church gatherings and assemblies because we need to be a church for all people and politics in kenya is very tribal it's very polarizing and if we have a politician from one party that will turn off uh members of the other party in the congregation so we're we're not anti-politics. We want people to engage in the political system, but there's a time and a place and it's not in church. Church is for the worship of Jesus Christ. Very straightforward. And Jackson, Archbishop Jackson Holy Sabbath has pushed this line. No politics. Well, uh, last uh, Sunday, the Bishop of Mount Kenya South, Charles uh, Muturi uh, said, hell with that um and he said that you know kenyans have a right to hear their politicians politicians are christians too and he had the uh, speaker of the kenyan parliament as a guest at a uh, fundraising slash eucharist service they're raising money for diocesan projects now oddly enough the uh, speaker of the parliament is his last name is also maturi so i wonder if they're related or what not and I, we wrote this stuff, but I did an I did an, a news analysis piece because a lot of people just sort of uh, roll their eyes and move on to the next story. But I I want people to understand what's happening, and we need to go back and say Kenya should not be a country. Why do I say that? Kenya is a country because that's what the British carved out uh, when they when they colonized that part of the world. Mm -hmm. And they created a cup and they created a country, as most countries are in Africa, that is not drawn according to geographical or demographic or tribal lines, but by but by European political lines. Kenya's largest minority is largest group is the Kikuyu, who are based around Mount Kenya, in the center of the country in Nairobi, and they compromise twenty percent of the population. One of the uh, about eight, I'm sorry, nine million people. The Luo are in Western Kenya. Uh, they uh, are about five million people. And then you have smaller tribes and other groups in the south and the north. One group is the Maasai. There are about a million Maasai in the south central. Maasai is split between Tanzania and Kenya. Why does this matter? Let's go back to the Mau Mau revolt, 52 to 60, when Kenya was fighting for independence. 
it was the Kikuyu who were basically foment fomenting the Mau Mau rebellion because the British settlers were in the nice parts of Kenya where the Kikuyu were. The, the, the Luo in Western Kenya basically backed the British government because there were no settlers there. They had no problems, the British building roads and schools and hospitals, you know, everything was just great. And it was the Kikuyu who really pushed independence and get the British settlers out. So going back to then, there was bad blood. And the, the Luo bishops, the bishops in Western Kenya have basically always gone their own way because they don't want to be bossed around by the Kikuyu bishops of the central Kenya. And we saw this at Lambeth 2008. Benjamin and Zimbi and the House of Bishops of Kenya announced they weren't coming. That's the Luo bishops of Western Kenya said, well, uh, <laughs> uh, let's go Brandon and uh, went to Lambeth. So there's a history of the Luo in the West doing their own thing. Well, uh, we come now to the present. We had this woman bishop consecrated. The Lu she's a Luo, Luo, L-U-O. And in Western Kenya, these dioceses receive money and support from Trinity Wall Street. And they are ones who have continued to accept American and liberal British money from liberal British dioceses and institutions. They don't follow the heed. So they went ahead and with the support of uh, Western backers, they went and ordained first a suffragan woman bishop, then a diocese woman bishop. Jackson Oli Sapit had pledged his honor not to consecrate woman bishops to the Afghan primates, and that means something. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's not an American politician where his word changes from situation to situation. No situational ethics. My word is my bond. That's the truth in Africa, for especially a man of significance. But Jackson read the tea leaves and the Luo and had formed alliances with other factions within the Church of Kenya that he couldn't maintain this. So he had to cave because he had no, he didn't have the numbers to push back. Well, we see. So those who are jealous of Jackson Oli Sapit, who is a Maasai, member of a small tribe, the Kikuyu, who have always been the primates, are annoyed that Jackson is the primate. Yeah. They're now pushing their own agenda, which is to have politicians who are Kikuyu attend Kikuyu church services and raise money and do this and that. So they feel strong enough to basically say, let's go, Brandon to Jackson Oli Sabbath on something that is not an issue of women's orders or homosexuality, but just politicking, something that everybody is pretty much agreed on. We don't want to split the church. The Kikuyu nationalist bishops are saying, uh, hey, you know, he's weak. We can do what we want. And, but we see this in Tanzania where there are two or three factions within the church in Tanzania that want to go their own way and don't pay any heed uh, to other groups. Um, and these forces are tearing apart the, uh, the Anglican Church of Kenya, the Anglican Church of Tanzania. They're also at work in Nigeria. We've, we've reported recently about the problems in Biafra. Um, the fake countries, fake in the sense they're not natural countries, put together by the British. Have come well, the there, were, there were seven Western countries that went for the scramble for Africa, that partitioned mm -hmm. it up. It wasn't just the British, but you know, to, to see this mess that's now you know become where tribe is against tribe within you know these countries that are not naturally made, they didn't naturally come about. Uh, you're right, we're gonna see without too much trouble the fall of some of these churches. We see, and it's not just, well, like South Sudan was the greatest example where you had an Arab North and a black African South that the mm -hmm. British said, okay, this, the empty, work. Bit, this, this work. The, the empty bits between Ethiopia and Uganda mm -hmm. and Egypt will call Sudan. And of course it never worked. And it finally broke apart in Sudan and South Sudan. Well, South mm -hmm. Sudan is now 
div divided into a war basically between the Dinka and the Noor, uh, the two largest tribes there who don't get a, don't get on. And one are pastoralists and the others are farmers. One are Hatfields, the other McCoys. Huh. Uh, South, South Africa, we see the Cape province, which is the wealthiest, most sophisticated province. Um, it's the most multiracial province wants to see from the rest of South Africa, which is corrupt and inefficient and dominated by one tribe here and one tribe there. Um, South Africa is going to have a hard time holding together. So the the letter, where I'm coming is, the letter sent out by Ford and Faith may be fine theologically, but it doesn't take into the reality, doesn't take into account the realities of the African church situation which is that uh, theology is really a is second or third order issue compared to tribe or nation or money. I would, I, I would say the number one issue, especially in these very impoverished communities, is going to be the Episcopal Church's money. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we reported last week and the week before that um, tech isn't going to have as much money uh, because of the Manhattan real estate decline and uh, other outlets they have for money but that doesn't mean that you know they can certainly pass on more money than gafcon can at this point they can pass on more money than the anglican communion and justin welby can so that is influence as sad as as sad as it is for me to to speak as a christian brother to other christian brothers uh who are being influenced by this type of money uh for some of them especially as we're going to see this hyperinflation over the, the fall it's going to be life and death with food um, in some of these communities. I, I hate we've to say seen, that, you know. We've seen cereal prices, grain mm. prices, jump about a third in East Africa, in mm. Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda over the past year. And there's a world that, according according to Bloomberg Financial, Bloomberg. <laughs> uh, the oat harvest this year in North America is the lowest in 20 years. Mm. So what that means for you and me, Kevin, is the Cheerios will be a little more expensive and the oat bran muffins will have a few less oats in them. But when worldwide world cereal and grain prices, corn, wheat, rice, all these things go up, it means less food for people in the developing world. And that causes political instability and war and civil unrest. And women priests, and frankly, homosexuality in the West get pushed way down the list of pressing concerns for church leaders in the developing world. And then when Trinity Wall Street can buy a diocese for 10,000 bucks, you and I might think, that's nothing. But when you have nothing, $10,000 is the difference between eating and not eating. That's, yeah. Or you know, making payroll for the, the clergy. You know, there's 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 a lot at stake, and uh, money was a bad, uh, evil commodity uh, three thousand years ago. Well, it's still bad now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The other thing I, I want to mention is uh, this past week we had the uh, inauguration of the province of Alexandria, the the formal ceremony. Mm -hmm. Alexandria is essentially North the North African, Ethiopian, and Egyptian diocese and Sam uh, Archbishop uh, Justin Welby came and uh, it was a great great to do Justin Welby on his way down to Alex to, to Cairo had to stop off in Rome and he did he did some ec ec ecumenical environmental stuff with uh, Pope Francis and he met with leaders of the it happened to be in the last week uh, Welby's met the head of the Ar Armenian Church and the Coptic Church and the Catholic Church and the Orthodox uh, Ecumenical Patriarch uh, Bartholomew. Well, where I'm going with this is that there's a perception in the world, a false perception, of the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's authority or power. Power, not authority, a power. I uh, subscribe to various news services and I subscribe to a Russian news service because once upon a time I spoke Russian. I can sort of read it now, but I still like to flatter myself. And this uh, story came across the wires uh, out of uh, Yerevan in Armenia. A delegation led by the Catholicos of the Armenian Church 
the head of the Armenian church, was in Rome, and they met Welby and Francis. And one of the delegation was an Armenian government minister. And this Armenian government minister, uh, according to the reports, spoke to Justin Welby and asked the archbishop's help in repatriating Armenian prisoners of war from Azerbaijan. Recently, Armenia and Azerbaijan had a border war, and Armenia lost, mm -hmm. and had some, some of their soldiers are prisoners, and there are reports of maltreatment. And the Armenians went to Justin Welby thinking he could do something. Now think about that for a second. Armenia and Azerbaijan are you know, the war in the Caucasus, it's on nobody's radar. I, I assume most of our viewers never heard that there even was a war. But they're asking Justin Welby to help get their boys back from Azerbaijani prisons. When you make that request, you're sort of assuming that Justin Welby, you know, he may or may not be interested in helping, but does he have the staff? Does he have the influence? They're investing some power into Justin Welby that the Archbishop of Canterbury's have never had. And certainly the British government could care less what Justin Welby says. And, most issues. But that's what's changed the most over the last 20 years. I think 20 years ago, an Archbishop Carey could have went to his contacts within the UK government and said, is there something that can be done here? Is there a way forward? Is there some type of influence where we can get these people repatriated uh, post-war? I think now the Church of England, certainly Justin Welby, uh, any bishop within the, the Church of England, doesn't have the clout to uh, uh, approach anybody within Parliament and say, "Hey, we got a problem, and we want the uh, UK government to, you know, bail out these prisoners." Doesn't exist. Yeah, I would say you have to go even farther back than well, but you have to go back to Robert Runcie. You remember yeah, Terry okay. Waite? Sure. Yeah. Terry Waite was Robert Runcie's envoy to the East. Mm -hmm. Terry Waite actually was doing something and getting. Uh, American, you know, helping find hostages held by Hezbollah, I think it was, or Hamas, in Lebanon. And then, unfortunately, Waite was uh, himself captured and was a prisoner for many years. Well, what that came away with was the British government really smacking down Robert Runcie, saying, Lambeth Palace may not have its own foreign policy. You are not a an entity that can... Uh, call its own shots you're not the un they they were very specific about this they said you're stop not doing the, this you're getting in the way you know we're we're not going to do you know, basically the the terry wade affair was a fiasco for the institution of the anglican communion and the archbishop of canterbury in that it hardened government attitudes towards the interference of these clerics in serious business of world affairs. So ever since then, uh, any statement by Welby or company or by Catherine Jeffrey Shorey on this or that and the other is, oh, that's nice, it's just noise in the room. Um, well, I think the Armenians haven't cottoned on to that yet. <laughs> well, but, or they're just so desperate you know, we'll ask anybody. But right now, Justin Welby, um, certainly uh, Michael Curry, at least half the communion, the only power they have right now is the power of the press release. They can go back to their home offices and write a press release that we're really concerned about this. And would you please offer prayers for this? But other than the press release, the archbishops of the Anglican Communion and the bishops of so many of these uh, Church of England dioceses have no power, authority. It, it, it's vanished over time. And yeah. There's also an American perception that's wrong is of African solidarity. Yeah. Do you remember when we were in Jerusalem? Uh, we were this is the first Jerusalem GAFCON conference. Sure. Bar a man named Barack Obama was just elected president, and we asked. Uh, you know, Henry Arambi and Benjamin and Zimbi and all these people, what do you think? 
And essentially they said, well, we don't really want to be political about this because we don't know how this guy's coming out. But first off, just because the guy is dark skinned doesn't mean he, this is the son of a Luo Muslim. Right. Uh, <laughs> who, is, who is an enemy of us Christians in Kenya. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the other side. Yeah. Um, there was no outpouring of ethnic brotherhood towards Barack Obama from the African church because they did not view him as they did not view him as we Americans viewed him. Well, they viewed him as a black man. They they were they great for the heritage, but they did not blue, view him as an African. There, there was that distinction. He he's not one of us. You know, and it's great they, that America. They, yeah. it, it was great that America voted for a black person. They they were very pleased by that. But he, in no uncertain circumstances, did the people we talked to think he was an African. <laughs> it's funny because then you have Americans think he's really an African he's a born in <laughs> So poor, poor Barack, he can't win either side. But but the point is that we uh, we project onto others mm -hmm. the the assumptions that we bring into this. America projected onto Barack Obama something that the Africans did project onto him. Mm -hmm. The Armenians are projecting onto Justin Welby an authority. Uh, the global the Global South Coalition has not followed Gafcon because they still are beset, beholden to this image of Justin Welby and the office of the Archbishop of Canberra having some sort of influence in the councils of the British government. Now it has none, or if it has none greater than a trade union or any other any other international institution in England, but that still is what keeps people like Munir and Nice on side, is the hope against hope that they can get something out of Welby that will benefit their country. And maybe it's because I'm an American and have uh, not a high regard for these international machinations. But I just see it's a total waste of time. Well, no, you and I used to have regard for the Sea of Canterbury in the office of the Sea of Canterbury. Um, but we've just seen how ineffective it's been over the last uh, 20 years. And we, uh, you, you, George says, I go back 60. Okay, 60 years. You know, uh, <laughs> I go back to 1680 or whatever. Okay, all right, all right. So, you know, it clearly... 1688, the Glorious Revolution. But... Yeah, 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 yeah. And so we, we just, you know, no matter how far you back, go back, you can see that the Sea of Canterbury has just lost influence and power over time. And especially now in the age of social media, in the age of um, uh, kind of Africa regaining its grounds and what's happening here in the West and how culture has really taken over the church, the Sea of Canterbury is no greater than its press releases. And we're stuck with that. And so George and I have this, you know, as press people, we see these institutions of the church, these instruments of unity, as just play, where people go to waste their money and get together and uh, try and sell mosquito nets. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's nothing more. And that's how we always have great hope when we see organizations like GAFCON get together behind core documents and doctrines and a, a fellowship and, and and brotherhood that we're like, yeah, you, you can go. And we see them take two steps forward and one step back and two steps forward and one step back. Um, I don't see the Anglican communion leadership taking any steps forward anymore. I just see them issuing press releases, which we will gratefully reprint on Anglican Da Inc. George, we have one final story. We're 44 minutes in. Let's talk about Lester. Now, all the time, I want to revision the church. I want to reimagine the church. How, you know, how could the church be better? How can we reach people easier? How can we serve our community with a better reimagined, revisioned church? And we've seen this for 2,000 years. Somebody's always said, you know, the problem with our church is the gospel. You know, it just, it, 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 it's offensive. It, 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 people, it, they don't want to come to the Sunday worship and be judged and feel uncomfortable and think God is judging them or the, the clergy is judging them. We, we need to reimagine church. Well, here we are, 2021, Leicester Diocese, Church of England 
is going to, well, not Church of England, um, is reimagining Church Again George. This past Saturday, the uh, Diocesan Senate voted by 70% margins to adopt the bishop's plan to re uh, configure the diet, reconfigure churches. The diocese would go from about 340, 300 plus churches to about 20 to 25. And these would be minster communities that would in essence have authority or responsibility for 20 or 30 other churches. But there would be four salaried people at the minster uh, one a one a lay administrator, one an evangelist, one of this and one of that, and essentially they would be creating a circuit rider system based out of these uh, uh, central minster churches. Now the genesis for this is that a financial report released by the treasurer a year or two ago said Leicester was not sustainable. the The current system wasn't working. We didn't have enough money coming in to keep the number of clergy and churches we have open. So they were faced with three choices. Uh, the first choice was, let's cut the bureaucracy at the diocesan office. English dioceses are, compared to American or Canadian dioceses, are monstrosities of bloatedness. That there's a woman's advisor, a minority's advisor, vocations advisor, a youth advisor. Climate change. Climate change, climate change, full-time salary clergy people doing nothing but sitting at desks and thinking great projects. And each of these has an, and then their deans, rural deans and archdeacons and all these people who work for the central office. And you could cut these out, save money by getting rid of people there. Or you could say each parish is going to stand or fall on its own. If you can't afford a priest, you're not going to have a priest. Then you're just going to have to pay for a flying visitor every so often or shut your doors. The third uh, is sort of an option of, well, let's reduce overhead. Let's reduce some churches. Let's see how we can make it work. And then the bishop proposed a fourth, which was let's increase the number of bureaucrats, cut the number of priests by 25%, and stick them in centralized locations and put them in cars to zoom out, you know, and cover three or four churches on a Sunday and have lay people pick up the slack on pastoral care. I think that's the worst option and that's what Lester voted for. Yes, but they're, they're stuck. We talked, we started this program talking about protecting our own. We'll protect our own against accusations. We'll protect our own, uh, you know, against credible accusations. Uh, and what we find here is the Diocese of Leicester protecting their own. We're going to protect the middle management. We're going to protect the people who are pushing the papers and writing the press releases because we think they're the most important part of the church. You and I, as uh, uh, what is, is that your dog making noises over there? <laughs> yes, he's found purple puppy. He's bored. He's been listening to me and. Well, you don't know this, but behind you, he's been going back and forth by your bookcase. So the audience oh. loves your your, your, your your little puppy right now. Um, and so they're protecting the middleman. And why would we let people go who made, who made up the ranks uh, to middle management in this diocese? Uh, the problem clearly is not us. And yeah, mm -hmm. here we are again. Uh, a church has misidentified the problem. Yeah, it's, a, it's also a faulty theological position that the diocese is the church. Mm -hmm. Anglican articles say the church is, that, uh, is the gathering of people worshiping. It's not the bishop at his desk with his secretaries. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can, I don't think you can justify this administratively, financially, practically, uh, or theologically, but you can justify it as preserving the what is important to the institution, which is the bishop and his staff mm -hmm. and his prerogatives. All right. Now, now you're looking like an evil world leader. <laughs> Got your yeah. little pooch there. Yeah. 
Dr. No, George No, oh boy. All right, you watch the Bond series of Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 691 of Anglican Unscripted.